Already, gang, in this thermodynamics problem, we're going to use the isothermal compressibility to determine how much a liquid will shrink in terms of its volume. And this is the problem right here. And I must admit, I'm pretty amped up about this problem because it uses real data. The link to this data is in the description to solve this problem here. Uh, and pause the video, work through it. Even if you don't know how to solve this problem, see if you can come up with something and then unpause the video and work through it with me. Okay, let's begin. So here's the question. How much will liquid water shrink at 298 Kelvin if a pressure that is 8,000 times greater than atmospheric pressure were applied to it? And the isothermal compressibility of water is given below. So kappa is the isothermal compressibility and it's not a number. In this case, it's an equation because the isothermal compressibility really changes based on the pressure. And it does change. This is real data on, on water, uh, 298 Kelvin. So you plug in a different pressure, kappa is going to be different. So we're going to start off with the definition of what the isothermal compressibility is. And it's defined as negative 1 over the volume times the partial derivative of the volume with respect to pressure holding the temperature constant. This 1 over the volume is to ensure that this is an intensive property. Okay, so from th at this point, we're going to multiply both sides by dt to get negative kappa dp equals dv over v. And the reason we did this is something called separation of variables. So kappa is an equation, and kappa is in terms of p. So we have everything in terms of p, one variable on the left, and everything in terms of v, one variable on the right. So we separated our variables. We can integrate now both sides from the initial to final state, pressures and volumes. And we can plug in what kappa is because kappa is going to change, so we can't pull it out of the integral. So we substituted it in the, uh, the equation in right here, and we left this one the same. Now I'm going to give us uh, ourselves some more room and move this equation up top. And to do this integral, it's not too bad. Even though it's very long, each term is just a polynomial. So we're going to do the reverse power rule. You can think of it like that on each of, each of these terms here. Do the reverse power rule. And we're going to go from 100 kilopascals because we're assuming that we want to go 8,000 times greater than atmospheric pressure. So if atmospheric pressure is 1 atm, 1 atm is approximately 100 kilopascals. It's not exactly 100 kilopascals, but notice that we're not precise with this number. Like this is 8,000. Technically, this is like 1 sig fig. So by saying where atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascals, which is 1 bar, which is a little bit different than 1 atm, it's pretty much the same. Okay, and then we want to do 8,000 times more than that. And then we want to do equal to the integral of this. So integral of 1 over v is ln v. And ln v2 minus ln v1 using the log law is the same as ln v2 over v1. Okie dokie. So if we plug this into our calculator, like this, uh, at eight, 800,000 minus this number at 100,000 kPa, uh, we should get negative 0.1. Uh, 10559 uh, equals this ln of thing. Now to solve for V2 over V1, because we want to know how much it will shrink, we're going to convert this to logarithmic form, or sorry, to exponential form. This is logarithmic form. Convert it to exponential form, e to the power of this. And if we plug this into our calculator, we'll get 0 0.8998, which is approximately 11% smaller. So by applying a pressure that's 8,000 times greater than atmospheric pressure, which is quite significant, right? Quite significant. Um, it'll be 11% smaller. Now we can do an approximation. This is doing the lawns of both sides, but because liquids and solids don't shrink that much when we apply pressure, we can say that this dV over V is approximately delta V over V. We could do this approximation here. So this infinitesimal change throughout this whole thing is approximately equal to this finite delta change. And if we do that, then this number here, this negative 1.0.10556 becomes this delta V over V, which is approximately 9.4% smaller. So doing this shortcut, which is a little bit quicker, it's very close to the actual one. Okay, y'all, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some value from this problem and it gives you some further insights into thermodynamics. Good luck on your midterms, final exams, continue going through problems 
problems after problems, go through them in the textbook, go through all the problems that I that I post online here and keep hanging in there. You don't have to be the smartest person in Thermo. I say this all the time, but you do have to go through a lot of problems and be very persistent with it. Uh, you can do it. Uh, I was not good at it when I first started Thermodynamics. I went through many, many problems, but now I know what I'm doing. Uh, so best of luck to you and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.